I'm Michael Fox, and this is the Prospector News Podcast, and I am joined by longtime friend and uh, companion, Chris Temple of the National Investor. Welcome back, Chris. Hey, Mike. Well, it's been a busy spring, lots of conferences. My conference uh, tour of this, of uh, North America seems to be wrapping up, but uh, I'm guessing your annual Chris Temple Tour of America, where you uh, visit all your kids and grandkids, is just about to kick off. Well, soon. Unfortunately, though, I'd like to be able to go sooner. is isn't going to happen until a little bit after the 4th of July, so probably mid-month and make a make a loop to make sure I cover everybody as best as I can and then uh, uh, be up uh, settled in northern Wisconsin and northern Illinois back and forth for a couple of months or so. Yeah, well, it's got to be a lot more pleasant up in uh, up in the north in the summertime than it is down in uh, in Florida where you are for the winter. So, well, generally speaking, I mean, you know, I'm, I tell people I'm a reverse snowbird because I've lived full time in Florida for ten years now, uh, but try and get out of here as much as I can during the hottest months. Uh, sometimes it makes little difference. I remember a couple or three summers ago it was you know it was as hot in in uh, Wisconsin as it was here in Florida and I twice during that stretch I was over in Rapid City South Dakota for a couple of different reasons it was hot it was hotter there than than it was in Florida so you you never know but uh generally speaking yes at it, it, least it's more comfortable up that way especially once I get into September that's really the fun time to be up there in, in September because uh you know, apples and and the winter squash are ripening that I can bring home with me, and and the bugs are gone, and I get to see a little bit of the fall colors starting before I head out. So that'll be nice, as always. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's nice to see the leaves change, and uh, but uh, it's probably good to be uh, be back where you where you live full time before the uh, the leaves hit the ground and the snow follows it. Very definitely. Well, since we last talked, the Fed has uh, got together, had another powwow and a meeting and uh, held firm on the rates again. Well, that was no surprise. Um, I, I said before the Fed meeting that I thought that if there was any surprise, it might potentially be a little bit more dovish because a lot of the Fed heads in the recent past have been warning that with inflation for most of the first half now of 2024 having been elevated again, it rebounded quite a bit, especially in the first quarter from what it was going down to as 2023 ended, that you know the, the Fed through its jargon in recent weeks has been prepping everybody for the idea that maybe they don't cut interest rates at all. Maybe they cut only once. And so I kind of mused out loud, well, you know, in March, the last time they officially did it, uh, what what all of the voting members of the FOMC do is they all put down their projections for, inf you know, inflation, where they think it's going to be for rate cuts and the, the economy and whatnot. And back in March, the last official time they did it, the median bet uh, which they always modify, you know, they they kind of get swayed to and fro with the the economic stats. But they were saying we would have three rate cuts in 2024. Uh, more people than not thought that yesterday would they would go to two, but they actually went down to one. Uh, furthermore, uh, four of the members said they don't see any rate cuts this year. And that, as Fed Chairman uh, Fire Marshal Jay Powell, said in his news conference afterward, that is after they got the cooler than expected CPI number yesterday morning before they came out with their news, because there were some people that were incredulous. Well, how could the Fed still say that they're only going to cut rates once? Didn't they get the inflation number? Didn't they have a chance to get that cooler inflation number baked in? Well, yes, they did, but that's still what they came up with. So really, when you, you look at the preponderance of what the Fed statement itself said and what Powell said, they are leaning not so much to the dovish, but to the hawkish side. But as always, 
when the markets see 55 or 60% of the rhetoric is arguing against rate cuts, maybe at all this year, and 40% of the rhetoric says, well, if this and this and this and this go right, maybe we will cut one or two times. That's 40% is all that matters. <laughs> you know, that and the ongoing AI craze on Wall Street. So, you know, once again, a Fed meeting which reinforced the idea that inflation and interest rates both will stay higher for longer than most people want to admit. Uh, didn't really matter a whole hell of a lot to people. And indeed, they actually bumped up their inflation projection from ending the year at 2.6% to ending the year at 28 Yeah, no, definitely. And it's funny, uh, the markets themselves, they're kind of like your grandkids. You know, they hear what they want to hear. So, you know, in your case of your grandkids, you can tell them whatever, but all they heard was, I'm getting ice cream. You know, and the markets are going, well, the Fed's going to pivot, the Fed's going to pivot. But, you know, we're not seeing any signs of that at all. No, we're not. And uh, I don't think we're going to. You know, you got to keep in mind that Chairman Powell, look, we, we it's water under the bridge now, unfortunately, but he's chiefly responsible for this whole dilemma to begin with because he was running the Fed when the Fed went ape shit with money printing, with COVID as an excuse, they created 30% of all of the U.S. dollars ever created in the history of the U.S. of A, all in, in the space of about two years. Well, no wonder you've got inflation. And even now, as I heard one commentator point out yesterday with this notion that the Fed is overly restrictive and they're going to have to ease, well, you can't, you can't get that from the financial markets, certainly where the S&P and NASDAQ are hitting new highs, even though it's fairly thin and you know led by a relative handful of stocks, which has been the case most of this journey. Uh, you certainly can't get it from the amount of corporate issuance of all kinds of paper, even at higher rates. So if you look at N2, the broad money supply, you had this parabolic increase because of COVID, and then it started coming down. It's actually reaccelerated to the upside in the last several months. But even before that happened, your your growth, if you look at a chart, and I've shared this a few times with my audience, the chart of M2, the level of the money supply is still substantially above what was already a long-term inflationary uptrend going back a few decades. So Restrictive is in the eye of the beholder, just like recession is in the eye of the beholder, depending on how big your stock portfolio is or if you even have one. So this is, you know, this is, I, I think, not well understood by markets. It is well understood belatedly by the Fed. And so Powell is dealing with the legacy that he started. He doesn't want to leave with the guy that unleashed inflation after 40 years. He really is serious that he wants to undo that mistake. He wants to undo his transitory legacy and have a legacy when all is said and done that, okay, he screwed up, but he fixed it before he left. And we did get back to sustainable low inflation. So he's not going to be in a major hurry. Whatever whatever the whiners in the market uh, are, are, are pining for. And the other thing, even beyond that, we've heard this out of his mouth countless times, is he also doesn't want to repeat the mistake that Arthur Burns did in the 1970s when Burns was Fed chairman and accommodated President Nixon's inflation uh, inclinations himself. We all know the story that in 71, inflation, uh, or uh, Nixon took us off the gold standard. Uh, his Fed chairman, Arthur Burns, started printing lots of dollars. The value of the dollar went down. Inflation went up. He had to raise interest rates to defend the dollar, and he stopped and reversed course prematurely. And then later in the, in the 70s, the inflation rate reaccelerated big time, and he had to raise rates a lot, maybe more so than had he not made that mistake in between. And so Powell has said many times, I don't want to repeat that, because if we do start cutting rates and we're wrong, and inflation isn't back in a bottle, then we're going to have to do more damage in the end 
than we would do if we stick to our guns. And that's his mindset. And the markets regularly, they don't want to believe that. No, they 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 don't like he it's like he's speaking a completely different language than the market is hearing. But I'm looking at it in a different way right now, is that Powell actually might be getting help from the other central bankers. Um, Europe, Canada, I believe Japan, have all uh, undergone some recent interest rate cuts in the last little bit. And given that that's going to likely, you know, move to strengthen the, the U.S. dollar, a stronger U.S. dollar would lower inflation in America, and Powell can sit here and do nothing and look like a genius. Well, we'll see. First off, I, I got to correct you on one point. Japan bumped up interest rates a little bit recently, and they're trying to so-called normalize policy, but only in a couple of baby steps. They're, you know, they're they're so far gone as far as their internal finances that. There, there's not a whole lot of room for them to do much. That's a whole different kettle of fish anyway. But but yeah, on the Bank of Canada, they cut rates a quarter point. The ECB cut rates a quarter point. Uh, interestingly, when, it, when the, the European Central Bank several days ago cut interest rates, this was last week, uh, Christine Lagarde introduced a talking point that we're going to hear increasingly from the Fed. In fact, we heard a little, a little bit of this out of Powell's mouth yesterday, and that is that when the point does come that the Fed cuts interest rates, whether it's later this year, early next year, whatever, it is not going to be the beginning of a new rate cutting cycle. The term that they will use, and we're already hearing it, is that we will get a mid-cycle course correction. So in other words, and, and, and I'm not really paraphrasing too much from what he said yesterday and kind of musing about how this may play out. You know, the Fed, when they get to the point where they think it's safe, might lower rates once or twice and then stop again for a number of meetings and make sure that they're still on the right path down to their so-called target inflation rate. Christine Lagarde said that, you know, this 25 basis point cut, you know, was a mid-course correction or whatever and may be an orphan for quite a while. And so that's the rhetoric we're going to hear. And, and where I think, you know, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, the market is full of a lot more money than it is brains, and, and there's always an excuse for traders to chase stuff that's already overpriced. But that aside, Mike, I think the big picture theme that the markets still are totally oblivious to is this terminology of when a rate cut or two does come, it will not be the start of a rate cutting cycle. But a lot of the people in the markets are behaving as if that is what's coming and they want to aggressively get out in front of it. And how long it's going to take to play out before they realize that they're not going to get this maybe for a very, very long time. And that we are going to have to get used to the idea that we're not in a binary world anymore, because that's what they think we've got. We're in a binary world. The rate hikes are over with. When the Fed starts cutting, it's going to be all the way back down to zero or one percent or something like that. And everything is going to be safe and you're going to have the Fed put again and all this stuff. That's not what's coming. And the Fed has tried to explain that. But again, the markets are like that three-year-old kid. So... You know, we are in a different world. We are not going to go back to zero interest rates unless we have a major black swan event, a depression, and then we'll get them again for a little while. But barring that, if we can continue with this muddle through economic existence, which is kind of my base case, you know, that base case of the great stagflation that I've mentioned so many times, that's not the stuff of getting interest rates a whole hell of a lot lower than where they already are. No, no, it's not. And, you know, I'm glad you brought up that, you know, they would take something pretty drastic to take us back down to zero again. And I was going to say, if the markets wanted to get back to zero, they should be careful what they wish for. That's right. Let's take another look at, at the the CPI and all of that. You know, they, they have suggested that it's going to remain higher than what they actually forecast. So, 
how realistic is it that the Fed's actually going to drop interest rates, you know, at least once this year? Like, I, I'm still in the camp that it's not going to happen. The markets seem to think that it's going to happen as early as September. And I can't, you know, given that there's an election in your country, I can't see if it were to happen this year that it happens before December. Um Am I out to lunch or, or you know, am I, well, am I being more realistic in the markets? You probably are. You know, if the Fed has its way, they would prefer not to do anything past the middle of the year. So, you know, you've got one more Fed meeting before what most people think is kind of a no man's land. So if they were of a mind to lower rates, they would do it in July once and then sit back and wait. They're definitely not going to do it in July, not after yesterday. Um, if they did it in September, they would have to have a darn good excuse as to why the economic statistics have deteriorated so much in a couple of months' time that it compels them to move. I don't know that that's going to happen. You know, so if they have their choice, they don't want to do anything that was going to be deemed as, quote, influencing the election, even though in this case it would be against the hated orange wonder and ostensibly something that would help Joe Biden. Uh, they don't even want to do it in that context if they if they can avoid that. So, you know, I, I, I hear again, they bumped up by two tenths what they expect the inflation rate to be at year end. If they're correct in that view, then they're going to get to the November and December meetings and say, you know what, we are going to push the rate cuts more to next year. And Powell tried to make that point yesterday, Mike. He said that, look, we took away a couple of rate cuts for 2024, but we added one for 2025. So it's not like we, we don't think we're going to get there at some point, but it's that we just are pushing it out just to be doubly sure that we're going down to our 2% run rate. But, you know, I think as time goes on, they're going to be more and more challenged to defend how realistic that 2% mantra is or have to come up with some real rhetorical contortions to explain away why they're going to start cutting rates before there's ever any real assurance that we're going to get down there. And that's going to be interesting because, you know, I, I listened to uh, Jeff Gunlock of Double Line Partners yesterday. He's one of the smarter guys out there. Nobody's right 100% of the time, you or me or even him. But he always has some good insights. And, and one of the points that he made is exactly this, that the Fed, however they're going to sell it in the end, is going to have to come to grips with the fact that they're going to have to start cutting rates without the assurance they say they say they want that we're sustainably heading towards 2%. How are they going to do that? You know, if you take the last few years into account, decade through right now, their own preferred PCE inflation measure is 3%, the average per year. So does that mean that in the next 10 years, it's got to be one on average? to average out over the long run 2%. They themselves, the Fed, has made that excuse before. There's no way, short of a major depression, that we get down to 1% or 2% for that matter. So yeah. I think what's going to happen as time goes on is that, you know, inflation is going to stay sticky. You know, 25 to 3% on the bottom will pop up from time to time above that, depending on energy prices where they got a gift this last month, that energy didn't keep going up in May. Um, you know, and, and I, again, it's I, I continue to insist that we are not going back to the, the disinflation world because too many things have changed. We're going to get used to 3%, 3.5%, 4 whatever, on average going forward. And we're going to have to get used to interest rates, especially on the long end, staying where they're at, maybe later going higher. If inflation accelerates, the economy stays halfway decent, but more so as this god-awful gargantuan supply of paper that Uncle Sam needs to sell all the time 
continues to come out in these kind of quantities that we've seen. You know, what happens if we do get a recession? And instead of a two or three trillion dollar annual deficit, when the economy is allegedly good, it's going to be four or five. It really, we're really going to sell all of that paper at, at progressively declining interest rates? I don't think so. I, I can't see that. They're, I'm hearing that they're having trouble selling the paper that they they have to flip over now as it is. Well, on and off, that has been happening recently. There's been a few times where the auctions don't go real well, and they've got to go ahead and knock down, or, or rather raise the yield a few basis points. Um, one of the things I said in my newsletter that I just put out early this week is that, you know, you've got to compare right now the U.S. with, let's say, China. China has got the largest debt to GDP ratio when you add up public and private debt of anybody on the planet, well over 300%. The U.S. is maybe half of that when you add a reasonable number in for private debt on top of the 100 plus percent public sector debt. Yet in China, their 10-year government obligation market price is half the yield of what it is in the U.S., why? Number one, because the sheer volume of the, the debt that they need to fund is nowhere near what the U.S. is trying to fund. We're not, they're not into the multiple trillions of dollars of deficits. So even though in relative terms, some of their metrics are worse, they're not that bad, okay, as far as the volume they're trying to sell. Secondly, unlike the U.S., China indeed is in a disinflation bordering in some ways on deflation. They've got massive overcapacity, massive overbuilding, massive debt overhang. And they're kind of like in some ways, and a lot of people have made this comparison, what Japan was when their financial bubbles burst back starting in 1989. And you had you know 30 years or so of disinflation, interest rates at zero. And you can have interest rates at zero with massive deficits if you don't have much of an inflation rate and you're able to sell that paper. So Japan was able to do it. China so far, so far has been able to do it. You know, the only way the U.S. sees yields come down is if we do go back into recession and massive disinflation, and then the economy sucks. And that's a bigger political problem. So the reason why all of the numbers are higher in the U.S., I guess, is because we have, relative to the rest of the world, still a robust economy. You know, it's got its cracks that not everybody is sharing. But compared to how everybody else is doing, we're you know we're doing halfway decent as far as the official numbers go, and that's why, uh, besides the supply that needs to be sold, uh, interest rates really in the U.S. and this was never this way are the highest in the world among major nations and major trading blocks. Ten-year notes you you can't find anybody except for some of the you know, what remains of the peripheral European nations, you can't find anybody who's got to pay more for 10 years than Uncle Sam does. And that's yeah. with still a strong dollar, paradoxically. Yeah, well, and at the, at the end of the game that was their own doing, they, you know, had opportunity to refinance this debt at lower rates over the last few years, and they simply didn't take it. Well, no, I mean, and it shows you, you know, the idiocy of these political hacks that end up with government jobs, you know, with Treasury and things like this. I mean, there, there can't be a, a dumber numbskull in the history of the U.S. Uh, running the Treasury Department than the one that we got in there right now. Um, and about as dumb as her, you know, not over interest rates and debt, but over gold, you go back to Gordon Brown, who was the chancellor of the Exchequer in England when they decided it at the multi-decade low for gold to sell the UK's gold. So nobody said these public servants, even when they get into major 
positions of power and finance are are even of average intelligence, uh, and both of them prove that. So you know, uh, at what at some point, and it hasn't happened yet, it hasn't broken yet, but at some point there is going to be for the U.S. And again, it's just because of the sheer volume of paper. Doesn't mean that the dollar's toast, doesn't mean that the U.S. necessarily is toast, but because of the sheer volume of, of debt, the U.S. is going to continue to have to pay up when it sells this stuff. And, you know, the other scenario, Mike, that nobody is prepared for, and this is looming down the road, Gunlock has warned about this, uh, more so the likes of Jamie Dimon, the outgoing head of uh, shortly of J.P. Morgan, uh, Bill Gross and others have said, don't be shocked when the Fed starts lowering short term interest rates and long term interest rates go up, ultimately not come down. Nobody's ready for that. Uh, no. And that's that's likely the, the scenario that, you know, you're going to get, because in order to take the debt when it's that large. You know, people are going to want to take a premium on that debt. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that'll fix that if it gets so bad, and I've said you, you've heard me say this before, is that when things just become really untenable, there will be some manner of yield curve control in the U.S. If, if it gets if, if the deficit gets blown out that badly and the interest costs start really going parabolic, um, they'll figure out some way to stop it or try to. Whether it succeeds or not, we'll have to wait for that time. Well, they'll they'll end up basically borrowing from themselves. So, you know, the government will issue the bonds, and the the Fed will buy them. Well, look, the Fed already has monetized for years now a portion of the debt. They're not supposed to do it by charter. Whenever any of the um, Fed heads during the, the this new era of quantitative easing, which is in the multiple trillions of dollars, whenever they're asked about it by some member of Congress who who didn't get the memo that we're supposed to ignore this, the Fed's response always is, well, this is temporary. We are not permanently monetizing the debt. This the quantitative easing is temporary. Yeah, okay, fine. Like like death is temporary. Like taxes are temporary. <laughs> I was going to say the income tax in Canada was to pay for the First World War. Right. So, you know, yes, they monetize the debt. And look, you know, when Japan got into that same kind of a fiscal mess, it came about different ways, but the outcome was the same. You know, we all know that the Bank of Japan for a long time was buying the overwhelming majority of the debt that was issued. So they were directly monetizing it, not to mention, you know, buying stock, stocks and stuff like that over there. And the point will come more likely than not that the Fed will get dragged into that game as well because they won't have any alternative. No, for sure. Now, as we uh, we climb back out of this rabbit hole, uh, I want to you know I want to pull out another one for us to take a look at. Um, in amongst Paul's comments, I, I noticed one that uh, that stood out to me, and then he was talking about the jobs market and the payroll data uh, that indicated it's coming in hotter. So, in other words, people are making more money. Uh, that he would like them to be making. And he thinks that that's going to be sticky on inflation. Well, it is. And, and here's what's interesting. And, and you know, when, when we talk about the term stagflation, you know, it's the worst of two worlds. You've got rising prices, but weak economic growth or even a stagnating economy. That's the combination. And we had that in the 1970s where really one feeds into the other. We've had it again in the recent past. I think it's gonna we're gonna have it for a lot, a long, long time to come. But you know, wage inflation, Powell has insisted many, many, many times that we are not at the beginning of a wage price spiral, such as what defined the 1970s. And that was when you had, you know, in the US in those days. Uh, the a percentage of the workforce that was in labor unions was far higher than what it is today. And led by the labor unions, you had pricing power of labor. The, the unions would go to the, uh, the, the employers 
and say, look, inflation is going up at too fast a rate. Our employees can't keep up with it. You got to raise our wages by X. Okay, they, they do that. So then what does the employer do? They raise their prices to the public you know, by X. Now it's that much more expensive to eat. So the unions and the other employers, employees come back later and say, oh, we got to do it again because we're not keeping up. That was the wage price spiral. So, you know, last Friday, the numbers that came out for May for jobs, that was the worst part of it, that at least Friday last week gave everybody angst in the opposite direction. I was at, uh oh, you know, the Fed's never going to cut and wage inflation is still over 4% annualized, et cetera, et cetera. But what also came out last week, and this is going to be interesting how this plays out going into the summer and going into the election, because the jobs numbers, and Powell even had to admit this yesterday, uh, the official non-farm payroll jobs numbers arguably have substantially overstated how strong the job market is. And when you look at the household survey, when you look at the statistics of part-time workers, the job market itself is not nearly as good as the still historically low 4% inflation rate would suggest. So, you know, right now you've got a situation where, and you and I have talked about how there's this demarcation line in the past. Uh, when you talk to the average American household, especially if they're classified as a so-called working poor, you know, you've got the two and three and four jobs to make ends meet. They sure as hell don't think it's a strong economy or job market or anything. They're living hand to mouth. They're living paycheck to paycheck. And the amount of people suffering this has gone up steadily for the last three years. Not all due to Joe Biden, partly due to Joe Biden, but mostly due to Jerome Powell and his, his cohorts at the Fed. And this is why in the polls right now, even though Biden will come out, uh, he's busy right now still trying to start World War III over at the G7 meeting. Um, but if he didn't get around to it yet, guaranteed he'll be out or one of his people will be out if they haven't already been out today, lionizing how inflation fell last month. Prices are reducing now. Aren't, aren't I wonderful? Kind of thing. But the reality is when you look at all the polls, two-thirds of Americans, and that includes everybody, Democrats and independents, along with Republicans, don't feel that this is a strong economy. They aren't happy with Joe Biden's handling of it. And it's because the real world experience is much worse for the average household than Biden or the Fed has been telling us. And that's that's going to be the reality. So the job market is not going to improve between now and November. The only question is, does it get dramatically worse and just kind of you know erode uh, uh, underneath the scenes? But, you know, uh, this, this cake has already been baked, Mike, going forward. And, um, you know, no matter who gets elected, it isn't going to really change that much. No, and I remember Danielle DeMarca Booth, she talks about the lag effect of the actual unemployment numbers because if someone gets laid off today and they get a severance package for, you know, six, eight months, they don't start showing up into those unemployment numbers until they exhaust their, their severance. And I can't imagine with all, and especially at the lower end, you know, restaurant chains, you know, dollar stores, you know, they're talking about Target stores closing down, Walmart's closing down. Some of these retail and lower end jobs disappearing. I can't see where for, you know, for that lower end worker that this is getting any better for them. Well, it's not. And there are increasing signs when you look at consumer spending habits and so forth. And, and here again, you can't look at just the headline. If you look at a headline, OK, consumer spending is still inching upward. But that's because of a relatively small percentage of the population that is the wealthiest, that has the biggest stock portfolio, the highest incomes. They're still spending. OK, but. I would dare say the majority of Americans now are starting already and have been for a while to 
count count you know what they spend. They're going out to eat a little bit less. Um, you know, in the area that I live in, uh, St. Augustine, Florida. I mean, this is a tourist mecca. This is a major destination for a lot of people for vacations. It's a tourist town. It's a beautiful city. For anybody who's been here knows it. You know, the the oldest continually inhabited city in North America. And yet, even here, I've seen recently a couple of places shutting down, others cutting back the days that they're open. And, you know, there's only so much that, that people can do before they start curtailing their spending. So you're going to start to see things separate. And I think the American people and consumers everywhere, frankly, are going to have to more and more start distinguishing between wants and needs. Do you really need that new dryer right now? Or can you wait a while and the one that you have right now it still runs, you just got to run it an extra 10 or 15 minutes past what you usually are used to? That's what you're going to do. You know, maybe you don't buy as many new clothes. Maybe you don't buy the new car yet, et cetera. So, Regrettably, however, and again, this is going to hit the average household the hardest, the stuff that you don't have a choice on, food, energy, transportation, insurance of various kinds and whatnot, those are going to continue going up. And uh, I don't know if you and I talked about this before, but you know, getting back to that statistic, and this is where the average American is right now. Getting back to that statistic, and even Biden and some of his people are scratching their head wondering, why aren't I loved more? Didn't I bring inflation down from 9% and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff that they gaslight people with? But a Democrat, former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, got together recently with some of his buddies at Harvard, and they were looking at this very thing. You know, why is it that such a large majority of the population is disapproving of Biden's job on the economy. And it's because those people are not experiencing, you know, a cumulative 19% cost of living increase during Biden's term, but it's more like 20 or 30 or 40, depending on your own household's mix of what you spend money on. I mean, and to listen to what Summers and his crew came out with, you'd have thought you were listening to John Williams. Because they actually said that, you know what, people are pissed and, and the polls are this bad against Biden because real world inflation really is a whole lot worse than what the BLS, the Bureau of Lying Statistics, tells you and what the Fed tells you. You know, when rubber hits the road, it's, you know, it's exactly the, it's exactly that. Now, it just give you it, it's not a happy example. You know, in my neighborhood, we had a bad fire a couple of nights ago in a, a 20 unit apartment building uh, is basically uninhabitable. Um, the good news is nobody was hurt. Everybody got out. It's all good other than, you know, these were lower income folk who basically have lost everything. They were renting in that building for around eleven hundred dollars a month. Their replacement rent, if they can find a place, is going to be $1,700 and up because that's the difference between what they were paying and what the market wow. is demanding now. You know, so those people have just basically had a 60% increase in their cost of living and completely out of their control. Yeah. And you're going to see a lot of more people that are basically going to get health stopped where they can't afford to to move because the rents that they would pay if they were to leave would be so much higher. And last week I learned a new word that I hadn't experienced as well. It's called plating. And I was talking to a restaurant buddy and what it is is when a couple comes into the restaurant and they order one entree and they get two plates and they split the entree. And those that are going out now, they're starting, they're, they're seeing plating happen more and more in the restaurants because, you know, they, they want to go out to eat, but they can't afford two full entrees. Right. 
And, you know, they've gotten past, you know, the where, you know, we'll skip dessert or we'll skip the appetizer. They're, you know, they're ordering an entree and splitting it. Well, again, that's just an example of how people are going to be pulling their horns. And so so the the extension of that, which is going to play out over a period of time, Mike, is where there is simply no more room for growth. And you're going to see shrinkage in some of these industries just because the business isn't going to be there. What does that do to debt? Because when all is said and done, we live in a world run by what is called a fractional reserve banking system, where, and one of these days, I'm going to update a couple of my signature essays and distribute it. You'll see it and we'll talk about it. But you know, in the past, I've explained in very easy to understand elementary terms how this works. Simply put, for present purposes, the system we have requires ever more and really endless borrowing of money into existence to drive the economy. Interest costs are added to that. As time goes on, you need to increase the level of debt and interest costs just to keep things moving along and keep people servicing debts. So the system itself requires never-ending consumption, added borrowing, added spending, and all the rest. But at some point, you get to where the public and or business just can't do it that much anymore, and they start to pull in their horns. But the debts are still there. Now, in some areas where this is already playing out, somewhat is, and you you touched on it, is real estate. You know, in this country, you've got a lot of overinvestment and a lot of bad debts in commercial real estate, especially now in areas that are undesirable. A lot of commercial property, a lot of uh, higher end apartment properties in, you know, the, the both coasts of the U.S., for example, you know, the East Coast, uh, parts of California, a lot of these places are vacant. It started with COVID. It's gotten worse. It's gotten worse as people want to get out of these, you know, leftist crime ridden hell holes and move to the Carolinas or here to Florida with me or wherever. And all of a sudden you've got these structures where there's not enough, nearly enough demand for the office spaces and apartments. And, and there's been stories here and there for a while now of a lot of these apartments, uh, complexes and big office buildings selling for a fraction of what they changed hands for at the last sale. So the, the, the debt associated with these things is being obliterated. So I was telling our, our friends, uh, Corey Fleck and Chad Markwitz at the KE Report yesterday that this is the next shoe to drop. It's been percolating for a while, but we're going to see this become a lot more acute especially as a lot of the associated debts are rolling over. Uh, and there, the math just doesn't work anymore. Even if you could roll it over for the same interest rate, forget about the higher interest rates. And so the other thing the Fed's got to reckon with going forward is do they have enough of a, of a liquidity cushion from all the money they printed two and three and four years ago to compensate as more and more bad debts rear their head, more and more regional banks tied to these things go bust and have to be absorbed. How much ability does the Fed and the banking system have to deal with this before it's a crisis again? You know, uh, are they going to have the stomach to do what China has been doing for a while, or did for a while, I should say, and force losses across the board on the markets is a means of dis extinguishing some of this debt. China was doing that for a while. They kind of had to stop because they, the, the problem was that big. Now they're trying to inflate it away, uh, which is going to be an interesting thing to watch. You know, maybe that's what the Fed does in the end, too. But anyway, I don't want to ramble anymore on that. But that's one of the other challenges out there looming that may move the Fed whether it likes it or not, off of its higher for longer stick if they have to start priming a pump again to cover some of these bad debts. Yeah, well, that's that's the left shoe. Let's let's go to the right shoe. If families and Americans are having to cut back 
and have their own austerity because the cost of living keeps increasing and their debt load keeps having to increase because of it. At what point in time do they look at the government and say, hey, you got to stop spending like drunken sailors because we can't afford to keep sending the taxes to pay for your debt? Well, regrettably, uh, the American public long ago was sufficiently dumbed down that they don't really understand the danger uh, of this public debt and and what has happened over time and is still happening right now. The the values have changed. The population has has been, you know, misdirected away from you know worrying about the things we should be worried about. So. I don't know that you're going to have a big hue and cry, certainly from the public. And that is evidenced by the legislators. I mean, the Republicans, a handful of them, who are the only ones left in Washington who think that we should have limited government. They've thrown out, you know, they threw out a Speaker of the House. They brought in a new one who was spending money at a faster rate for most things than even Joe Biden wanted. So, you know, the Uniparty is alive and well on Capitol Hill. They have different priorities, certainly between the Republican part and the Democrat part of the Uniparty. But what is isn't always in common is that no deficit is too big. Um, and that's not going to change until that change is forced on them. And it's not going to be forced on them by the voters because the voters don't care, number one, enough of them. And number two, too many of the voters are benefiting. From all of these deficits, it's it's when all of a sudden uh, things in the marketplace change, and the amount of debt that that needs to be added to the public balance sheet just just there's not a home for it anymore, and that's coming. I don't know when, but it's coming. Yeah, well, it's like a slow moving car wreck sometimes. Uh, as always, if people want to follow your uh, your musings on the economy, and we've certainly had lots to talk about today, how would they do so, Chris? Uh, just go to nationalinvestor.com. If you're not already on it, make sure you sign up for my mailing list and uh, you know follow me also on Twitter or LinkedIn. Those, those links are on my website as well. Perfect. We'll uh, circle back each other again in a couple of weeks. I'm sure uh, the, the rate everything's been moving, we'll still have lots to talk about. I'll do that. That, we don't ever have to worry about that. <laughs> no, sir. The Prospector News Podcast is for educational purposes only. The opinions expressed are those of the participants and are not to be taken as investment advice. Listeners need to do their own due diligence and seek advice of a licensed investment advisor.